Hey guys, and welcome back to episode 8 of High Lit with Carlisle Fletcher. I'm your host, Carlisle Fletcher, and we're reshooting because of more technical difficulties. But, today's episode, we're going to be going through anandamide and PTSD, and just sort of the what is anandamide and how that affects people. Uh, we're going to transition into an update about the effects of alcohol in the brain um, and cannabis's relationship with obesity. Then we'll be going through... The Adolescent by Dostoevsky, and also Cancer Ward by Solzhenitsyn, and wrapping up with some Michigan bands. So, without further ado, here is the study that we're starting off with. So, here we go. Let's see. So, anandamide is a lipid mediator that acts as an endogenous ligand of CB1 receptors. These receptors are also the primary molecular, molecular, molecular target responsible for the pharmacological effects of THC, the psychoactive ingredient in cannabis. Several studies demonstrate that anandamide exert an overall modulatory effect on the brain reward circuitry. Uh, so, several reports suggest its involvement in the addiction production actions of other abuse drugs, and it can also act as a behavioral reinforcer of animal models of drug abuse. Importantly, all these effects of an anandamide appear to be potentiated by pharmacological inhibition of its metabolic degradation. Enhanced brain levels of anandamide after treatment with inhibitors of fatty acid, the main thing responsible for its de de degradation, seems to affect the rewarding and reinforcing actions of many drugs of abuse. Um, so, essentially, it's a compound in the brain which is naturally produced, and it reacts with the CB1 receptors, are, which are the endocannabinoid receptors, which are the same receptors that THC and CBD interact with. Um, this is the ECS, it's the endocannabinoid system in the body. It's in your skin, it's in your, like, you know, it's everywhere in your body. So uh, it's in your stomach, all these things. Your cells have these systems. And this is a naturally produced chemical, it's anandamide. So when we look at uh, brain imaging studies, uh, so this is a 2013 brain image study, when we look at 60 participants divided into people with PTSD, people with a history of trauma but no PTSD, and participants with neither, uh, all three re, uh, received a tracer that illuminated CB1 receptors. Um, and uh, specifically, women had more fear and anxiety than volunteers without PTSD, so women with PTSD. Uh, the PTSD group also had the lowest level uh, had lower levels of anandamide, which is a neurotransmitter, and endocannabinoid that binds to CB1 receptors. Uh, if, expl if anandamide levels are too low, the brain compensates by increasing the number of CB1 receptors. So basically, if your brain has too few of it, or too little of it, then your brain creates more environments for which it can utilize that chemical. Um, and it helps the brain utilize the remaining endocannabinoids. So it's like, you know, it's basically just trying to break down what it has. But this is finding that people with PTSD have a lower amount of this chemical. So like, you know, we've talked about dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin a fair amount in the community. And anandamide, I feel like, is not very well understood by the public. You bring that word up and people have no clue what you're talking about. You can say the bliss chemical, I guess, um, but I feel like it's not as catchy as oxytocin and the love chemical. Um, but essentially, it helps with, yeah, positive affectation, um, and also, like, uh, what is the word? Flashbacks. Um, obsessive recreation or visualization of unpleasant stimuli. Uh, and anandamide also having higher levels or healthier levels of that is correlated with, uh, I can't find the study, but just trust me, I'll, there's ways that I think it's in, it's in somewhere. But it uh, helps with the reducing those sorts of uh, relationships. It might be in this one, but this is a study on uh, anxiety and trauma with anandamide. But what we're going to look at is just the end, because uh, basically what the study was about is that it found that the ECS is related with uh, like the, it goes through like the and anandamide levels and like you know anxiety and like all these other na negative affects and how that can relate to uh, you know like how that's related to health and then he also showed that uh, they also another study showed that uh, THC and CBD modulated uh, the ECS um, our emotional processing was modulated by it 
where THC increased the skin conductant response of the presentation of fearful faces, whereas CBD administration led to a reduction of the same response. So the study suggested a putative role for pretreatment with THC to enhance instinction learner during exposure, exposure therapy, um, which I would say is like kind of like shocking people to make them more sensitive and then like therefore process these things better. And it's like, so we don't really have like a direct answer for when's the best you know it's like the answer isn't just like yes and often that's not the answer with cannabis uh the answer is using it at specific times like uh there's also studies on molly um mdma which show that having a uh, therapy environment in which there are two uh two therapists one male one female recreating the role of the mother and the father and a person is using molly in like a isolated or not isolated but a safe environment in which they don't have uh, responsibilities to drive or things like that is like incredibly effective to like work through trauma so um yeah it's like we're just looking at we're looking at the correct use of certain things at certain times in certain environments these things don't just fix these things but there's a relationship that could be figured out So when we're talking about PTSD, we're talking about anandamide, we're talking about these things, older veterans, let's say pretty likely to have PTSD. So this is a 2021 study uh, on uh, 514 veterans, 2,758 uh, controls, so people who are not veterans, and they found that veterans were less likely to use opiates and benzodiazepines compared to non-veterans. Veterans also reported di desirable health outcomes of cannabis for use for pain, sleep quality, health conditions, and quality of life. Conclusion: uh, Our work provides insight and policymaker or insights for clinicians, clinicians and policymakers to consider whether cannabis use can be viable can be a viable option to reduce or replace opiate and benzo use by older veterans with chronic physical and mental health conditions. So, you know, it's like veterans are, there's a lot of studies that have been done with veterans, but like there's a, you know, it's like they're, it's interesting that it's like they're more likely. So while they're reported lower use for pain related conditions, so they're not using cannabis to treat pain necessarily, they're also less likely to use opioids. So it's like, I would say like they're addressing these mental health issues, but they're also seeing these cross effects that help them uh, deal with the situation at hand. You know, so it's like, uh, I don't know. I think that there's an interesting correlation there that could be illuminated by another study. Um, and this is, uh, so this is Mechelam's work. Uh, he, so these are the other authors, but he's one of the authors on this. Um, so many patients with uh, PTSD achieve but partial remission with current treatments. Patients with unremitted PTSD show high rates of substance abuse. Marijuana is often used as a compassion add-on therapy for treatment-resistant PTSD. This open-label study evaluates the tolerance and safety of orderly absorbable THC for chronic uh, PTSD. Ten patients uh, with chronic PTSD on stable medication received 5 milligrams of THC twice a day as add-on treatment. There were mild adverse effects in three patients, none of which led to treatment discontinuation. The intervention caused a statistically significant improvement in global symptoms severity, sleep quality, frequency of nightmares, and PTSD hyperarousal symptoms. So, conclusion, orally absorbable THC was safe and well tolerated by patients with chronic PTSD. So, we have this substance that has been shown to affect similar levels or had to it has been shown to affect the same systems that a chemical in the brain which people with PTSD underproduce have and people with PTSD have shown that at least a population of them have found cannabis to be adequate treatment I would say that there's something to review there that might be able to show us why like what the effectiveness is for with cannabis and PTSD. Uh, there's studies that are mixed, but I think that that's what we should be reviewing for proving the efficacy of it. So this is another study. Uh, this is published 2021, May 15th. 
So impairments in inhibitory, inhibitory control and its underlying brain networks are associated with substance misuse. Research often assume a causal substance exposure effect on brain structure. This assumption remains largely untested and other factors, familial risk, may con uh, confound a exposure effects. We leverage a genetically informative sample of twins aged 24 years and a quasi-experimental co-twin control design to separate alcohol or co cannabis exposure effects during emo emerging adulthood from familiar risk on control slash salience network cortical thickness. So we're talking about brain sections and we're talking about the density of them. So again, we're talking about like the matter of the brain. Uh, in a population sample of 436 twins aged 25 years, dimensional measures of alcohol and cannabis use, uh, for example, frequency, density, quantity, intoxications, across emerging outholds were assessed. Cortical thickness of control slash salience network areas were assessed using magnetic resonance imaging and defined by fine-grained cortical atlas. And the results of analyzing the brain. So again, we're not talking about like, oh, you know, my nephew he started smoking weed at 17. Brightest fuck kid. He used to have 4.0 GPA. Now he's down the street selling metal. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about brain scans. Uh, the results are that greater alcohol, but not cannabis misuse, was associated with reduced thickness of prefrontal and frontal medical cortices, as well as temporal lobe, interparal uh, sulcus, insula, parental operculum, uh, precuni precuneus, and per parietal um, medial effects. Effects were predominantly prefrontal and right lateralized. Co-twin control analysis suggests that the effects likely reflect both a familial predisposition to mis misuse alcohol, and specifically for lateral prefrontal, frontal, uh, parental, medial, and right frontal oper uh, operculum and uh, alcohol exposure effect. Uh, the conclusion is the study proves not novel evidence provides novel evidence that alcohol-related reductions in cortical thickness of control slash salience brain networks likely represent the effects of alcohol exposure and premorbid characteristics of the genetic predisposition to misuse alcohol. The dual effects of these two alcohol-related causal influences have importantly and complementary implications regarding public effects and prevention prevention's efforts to curb youth drinking. So. Again, when we're talking about people who smoke weed in their teens who have brain damage, I would say <laughs> there is a little bit of a bigger culprit in the room where it's just like we have literal studies that confirm. It's not like a hunch. This is a confirmed thing that alcohol changes the density of your brain. It, ch it, just, it does that. Uh, and cannabis has been shown to do similar, not even similar. It's been shown to have effects on the brain, but it's not, it's not like this. It's not like this. There's like literal personality stunting that never, never goes away. Uh, so this is the, an epilepsy study, which shows a 44% reduction, 71 or 41, 61, uh, 34 and 53% reduction of, and we got up to a 71 uh, production or reduction of uh, seizures uh, and so you know it's like the idea is that so it's like our study provides further evidence of sustained seizure frequency and severity reduction over two years of treatment with a highly purified CBD and treatment uh, treatment resistant epilepsy in addition CBD was generally well tolerated minority of patients experiencing adverse effects resulting in stopping CBD so Again, like this is treatment resistant epilepsy. These are conditions that are very hard to treat. And this is where it gets frustrating when people talk about cannabis as a uh, recreational substance or as a vice, is that it's like, well, what about epilepsy? What is your solution? What about PTSD? What about the boys coming home? Like we got so many homeless veterans and it's like, yeah, the homeless, the homeless. It's like, bro, like where's your like concrete solutions? Where, where are you going to go with that? Where are you going to, like, are you going you gonna to fix it? You got any solutions? Or you just want to bitch about what other people are doing? Um, so here we have 2021, uh, so 2021, April 28th, and this is uh, epilepsy in young children and adults, or young adults and children. Uh, 31%, 28, uh, 68.6, you know, so it's like you're having like real effects. These are medically relevant effects where you're getting real reductions in seizure, seizures from the treatment of CBD. Mechelin was talking about this in the 80s. So, you know, it's like it's just very fascinating to me. Uh, this is real. This is, I'm showing it to you right here. It's published in the NIH. Uh, it's PubMed, you know, like, come on. 
<laughs> and then uh, you got so another one is like this is a this is a 446 people in a methadone clinic uh, who used cannabis regularly. It was rep- that that report was associated with fewer self-reported non-fatal over- uh, opiate overdoses. So people who were medicating with cannabis were less likely to engage in uh, should engage. <laughs> Sorry, we're less likely to engage in uh, behavior that would result in an overdose. Um, so, the final thing that I wanted to go into, this is a article published by me uh, on 2020, 2020, 12, 2020, 2020. Uh, but yeah, so this is a, uh, it, it's covering this guy's work. And what I think is really important to talk about is that this is a meta-analysis on the risk of cannabis use in cancer. And ultimately, he finds that uh, cannabis is, if you control for studies that are likely to be biased, cannabis is likely to reduce the risk of cancer, or and it's correlated to reduce cancer use. And also, if you control for uh, prostate or no, testicular cancer. So if you control for testicular cancer, then cannabis is also... Uh, shown to have a association with reduced cancer risk. Uh, the issue that I really, really would like to highlight is, uh, so there's been a lot of research or a fair amount of research coming out lately about that uh, cannabis users are more likely to exercise or they're like, you know, that's the association is that they also have like lower BMIs and things like this. So when we're talking about obesity in America, um, the emerging epidemic of obesity, uh, you have decreased or decreased obesity rate in cannabis users obesity increases the risk of cancer cancers of the breast colon and rectum prostate esophagus stomach pancreas uterine corpus gallbladder kidney liver ovary and thyroid as well as multiple melioma are positively associated with obesity in the united states between 1982 and 2000 obesity caused about 20 percent and 14 percent of cancer deaths in women and men respectively so note that obesity rates are substantially higher today than in 2000, and rates of obesity-related cancers are increasing even in young people as the obesity rates continue to rise. I don't know about you guys, but I did have a friend when I was a teenager who was obese, and he did have cancer. That's anecdotal, but that's odd. The percentage of cancer deaths attributed to, are attributable to obesity are therefore likely, likely to be much higher today than they were in 2003 when the study was published, even as tobacco use and lung cancer are declining. However, using the numbers, uh, a minimum of 85,000 to, to 120,000 of the 607,000, uh, or 600, yeah, 607,000 cancer deaths projected for 2019 are caused by obesity. Similarly, an estimated 3.4% of all new cancer worldwide are caused by excess bat- body fat. So a recent review determined that cannabis use is associated with uh, reduced obesity risk and be and a lower bmi like weight loss following bariatric surgery reduced obesity rates and response in cannabis may reduce cancer risk so uh obesity is an independent predictor of gastric and liver cancer um those are strongly associated with obesity so i mean also it decreases inflammation because inflammation is uh is, is associated with obesity and it also, like, obesity has a different gut microbial flora. So, like, uh, cannabis may be able to protect against the changing of that. And this is a meta-analysis, so it goes through a lot of different studies, and it goes through a lot of information, and all this is very useful. But what I wanted to discuss is the conversation about obesity, because I feel like this is an under-discussed uh, thing, where it's like, A, we're talking about epilepsy, B, we're talking about autism, C, we're talking about schizophrenia, D, we're talking about obesity. Um, also inflammation you have like all these things that are just like how do you really treat these things like what pills do you give somebody who's obese fucking laxatives so cancers of the head and neck with the lowest meta-analytic meta-analytic remission rate of any cancer type are overrepresented in the data and cancers associated with obesity are underrepresented. Uh, furthermore, the data used are epidemiological rather than experimental, and thus can sow association but not causation. It is therefore necessary to res- exercise caution in interpreting the data. 
Nevertheless, data suggests that cannabis use may decrease the risk of cancer in the United States. So, can it, uh, de just de decreased, sorry about that one. Decreased cancer risk in cannabis users should not be surprising, as cannabis and cannabinoids decrease obesity, inhibit chronic inflammation, reduce fasting insulin levels and insulin sensitivity, and have direct anti-tumor actions. Furthermore, the actions in bladder would be exposed to the, higher level, the highest levels of carcinogens from cannabis smoke, yet risk of cancer of the oral fair genome in layer genome regions, and the bladder are significantly decreased in cannabis users. This demonstrates that the anti-cancer effects of cannabis outweigh the carcinogenic effects even in the airways and bladder where carcin car carcinogen exposure is high. So even in the place where you would be getting cancer from using cannabis, those cancers are not associated with cannabis use. It is possible that the actual decrease in cancer risk due to cannabis use is even greater than the estimated 10% decrease in risk emerging from the current analysis, as few data are available for the impact of cannabis use on the remission rate of cancers that are not exposed to the carcinogens of smoke, for example, those associated with obesity. Cannabis users showed decreased BMI and obesity rates. This decrease is known to be associated with decreased risk of associated related diseases, including DM and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Many cancer types are positively associated with obesity, including the cancers we discussed before. As well, so cannabis use may decrease the risk of these obesity-related cancer types simply due to the reduction in BMI associated with cannabis use. However, most of these cancer types are known to be inhibited or destroyed by cannabinoids in laboratory studies. Cannabis use is therefore very likely to be associated with substantial reduction in the risk and for mortality from obesity-related cancers. Um, so unfortunately, there's just not enough data uh, to like really nail this one home, but from what we're seeing on this meta-analysis that was published last summer, so it's basically a year old, there's like a fucking, sorry, there's a huge potential for treatment of obesity and thus cancer through cannabis use. Um, and it's like, it's got anti-tumor effects and it's also something that fights against obesity, which is strongly related to certain kinds of cancer. And so again, getting into the personal, I come from a family that struggles with obesity. Uh, at least my genetics come from a family that struggle with obesity. And what I saw in that is cycles of alcoholism and pharmacology. So you have these pills, which you discussed on Highlight, we've discussed this on the show, that make you fatter, that give men tits, that make you vomit, that make you feel unwell, that can add to irritability, that can make you suicidal. Like there's these pills that these people are on um, and they're drinking. So that is also something that increases your body weight. And then they're also eating fast food, so they're just blowing up. And it's like, uh, they <laughs> they didn't smoke weed simply because it was illegal. And some, as somebody who grew up smoking weed, weed was the first drug I ever, ever picked up. Um, smoking came after, it's like smoking tobacco came after, drinking came after. It was really tobacco, it was really weed that is my drug of choice. Um, I also am a very, very large advocate for psychedelic legalization. Um, but as for that, it was like, you know, it's like I started walking, started drinking water, started eating better, started uh, figuring out how to socialize better, just like, got much more in tune with life and just got much more balance from my day to day experience. And that's where I think that cannabis really shines. And I think that, uh, I think that reviews like this show that it's like, it's not about, that it fixes things directly or that it makes your band good. It's about the fact that it could help you f like not become obese, you know? And like, there's nothing wrong with body shame or there's not, sorry, that came out wrong. There's nothing wrong with body weight. There's nothing wrong with way of uh, living your life the way you want to live. As an individual, you're entitled to do whatever you want to do. There's no problem with that. I incredibly support that. Live how you want. If you're happy with it, fucking more power to you, you know? But as somebody who comes from an obese family, um, a lot of people on, like specifically everybody in my family who had, who were, who was born with a mother that was obese, at least one person in the generation is schizophrenic. And if you find this research from 2012, this was done on 305 cases of schizophrenic, or uh, cases of schizophrenia and 24,000 controls. And what they found was a two to three fold increase in the risk of schizophrenia in the adult offspring. So 
at least in two birth cohorts. So the high maternal BMI at both early and late pregnancy also increased the risk of schizophrenia in the offspring. So coming from a family with a lot of obese moms, a lot of schizophrenic children who are afraid to smoke weed, who everybody died of cancer. <laughs> you know, it's just it's it seems it seems interesting to me at least that it's like like uh it's like seen as this counterculture thing, it's seen as this very progressive, like fucking uh out and thing thing, but it's like I, I couldn't feel like there's something that draw draws me more to traditionalism. I couldn't feel like there's something that draws me more towards learning how to cook for myself and taking care of people and like just being more open to ideas. You know, it's like I feel so much more you know, like I don't I don't know how to exactly to describe it, but I just feel like color looks better. You're just more receptive when you're high. I feel like that is I, I can I can just say that one. But so I don't know. I think it's a interesting topic, uh, and I think it's a sensitive topic. Nothing about that was meant... So, again, there's no shame. Uh, all people are beautiful. All souls are souls. So, absolutely do not care how people showed up on this planet. Um, but, you know, there is just a conversation about, like, yeah, I'd prefer, I'd prefer to have less chronic illnesses. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to bitch over here, but, like, be nice. Be nice not to have chronic pain. It'd be nice not to be a little, it'd be nice to, you know, like, so I think having a adult conversations about these things and like if we decide to alter our lifestyles and live certain lifestyles or certain things, I think we might have better outcomes, you know, and it's like the only thing you can really control is yourself. If you keep yourself at a decent weight, you eat all right, and like you try to make sure that you provide for yourself and you don't rely on anything outside of yourself, I believe in you. I think you're going to be fine. I think you're going to be totally fine. So, let's get into the books. We're starting off with Cancer Ward by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I'll show you this passage because I'm only reading one. And it's got the bad man in it. So, uh, for the last 30 years, we've had it drummed into us that these people are reforming that they're almost now our social equals, but they work on the same principle as the bad man. If you're not being, the next word's an obscenity. It's got punch to it, but it really means if you're not being beaten, sit quiet and wait your turn. If your neighbor is being stripped naked and you're not, sit quiet and wait your turn. They're only too happy to kick a man when he's down, and then they have the nerve to wrap themselves in a cloak of romanticism while we help them create a legend. And even their songs are sometimes sung on the screen. So, oh yeah. So, the reason why I selected this passage is again, oh, that's just not going to turn out well. But, the reason why I selected this passage is again, uh, the only thing that matters is implementation. Good morals are cheap and beautiful. You know, it's fucking easy to paint a picture. It's hard to live a life. So, I just really wouldn't trust anybody who comes into your life with easy solutions or with things that seem ready-made or pre-packaged. Because um, people just... People want something to believe more than they want to do the work to figure out what actually works. Pragmatism is incredibly underrated. underrated. Utilitarianism, I feel like, is like libertarianism, where it's a word. So like libertarianism was the original egalitarians, where they were like radically far far left and they were like for the anarchy and the equality of man so now it's like weird to see where they are today but the issue with uh these sorts of people is that they fall for the idea or like the they fall for the they fall for the belief rather than the pragmatism where it's like the pragmatism is like it's like would a bridge be good here would it uh lower commute for the working class and would it like you know increase the general like flow of the city uh, should we reduce the wide, uh, Should we reduce the uh, the width of this street so that traffic flows at a more uh, reasonable rate, so children don't get hit by cars as often, and so that business can be more uh, can flourish better? Should we like uh, rip up this highway and maybe? Sorry, anyways. Uh, but like you know, um, 
pragmatism looks at like improving the things that you have and interacting with the world in a concrete sense. Um, and I think that when you're not dealing with people who have at least an appreciation or a, like they should have a very strong training in it, you're dealing with the most dangerous kind of people because they don't even know what they fucking want. They don't even know what the goal is. So next book we got lined up is we're going back. We're going back. Dostoevsky. This is uh, this is the book. Uh, he's gonna make my arguments for me, which is really nice because it's nice growing up on this literature, because then it, you just end up uh, anytime you need to prove yourself, you can just go get the fucking male role model. So uh, even in our most decent society, you will meet with the wish to lie, with the purpose of making your neighbor happy. For we all suffer from this unrestraint of the heart. Only with us the stories are of a different kind. What they tell about America alone is something awful. And that's even statesmen. I confess, I myself belong to this indecent type. And I've suffered from it all my life. The first is all rapture. Just let me tell you a lie and you'll see how well it comes out. The second is all spleen and prose. I won't let you lie. When, where, and what year? In short, he has no heart. My friend always let men lie a little. It's innocent. Even let them lie a lot. First, it will show your delicacy. And second, you'll also be allowed to lie in return. Two enormous profits at once. Que diable. One must love one's neighbor. But it's time I left. You've settled in nicely. But no, I know that I'm infinitely strong. And what do you think my strength is? But no, I know that I'm infinitely strong. And what do you think my strength is? Precisely the spontaneous power of getting along with anything, which is so characteristic of all intelligent people of our generation. Nothing can destroy me. Nothing can exterminate me. And nothing can astonish me. I'm as tenacious as a yard dog. I can feel in the most comfortable way two contrary feelings at the same time, and that, of course, not by my own will. But nonetheless, I know it's dishonest, mainly because it's all too reasonable. i lived in nearly fifty, and so far I don't know whether it's good that I've done so or bad. Of course, I love life, and that follows directly from things. But for a man like me, to love life is base. Lately something new has become, and the crafts don't survive. They shoot themselves. But it's clear that the crafts are stupid. Well, and we're intelligent, so it's impossible to draw any analogy here, and the question still remains open. And can it be only for such as we that the earth stands? Yes, in all likelihood, but that is too cheerless an idea. However, however, the question still remains open. Well, if you take it so much to heart, then it would be best to try and specialize quickly. Take up construction or law, then you'll be occupied with real and serious business. And you can settle down and forget about trifles. I by no means want to seduce you with any sort of bourgeois virtue instead of your ideals. Nor do I insist that happiness is better than heroism. On the contrary, heroism is higher than any happiness. And the capacity for it alone already constitutes happiness. So that's what's settled between us. I respect you precisely for being in your own s in our blah, blah, blah. so that's set, uh, so that's settled between us. I respect you precisely for being able in our soured time to cultivate some sort of idea of your own in your own soul. But all the same, it's impossible not to think about measure too. Okay, fucking, we're taking a little bit of a break, just because uh, tongue twist, but. Yeah, I love this book. It's The Adolescent by Dostoevsky. Handling a lot of just the idea of coming of age and like just entering the world. Obviously, I think there's a lot of cross-reference uh, relevancy uh, to today, what we're going through. Are just, you know, it's, it's just, these are, as somebody who didn't have a male role model, these books are very important to me because I don't know what everybody else is basing things off of. This is my model. Um, if anybody would like to share with me their model, and we can compare and contrast and talk about 
what is what what it is to be a man in the best way to implement masculinity in our life healthily <laughs> i'm down but uh i don't know it's just a weird topic i feel like it's not very uh it's not very much of a public discussion um so that's settled between us i respect you precisely for being able in our soured time to cultivate some sort of idea of your own in your own soul. Don't worry, I remember it very well. But all the same, it's impossible not to think about measure two. Because now you precisely want a resounding life. To set something on fire, to smash something, to rise higher than all Russia, to sweep over like a storm cloud and leave everyone in fear and admiration and disappear into the North American states. Surely there's something of that kind in your soul, and that's why I consider it necessary to warn you, because I've sincerely come to love you, my dear. A most excellent sign, my friend, even the most trustworthy, because our Russian atheist, if only he's a true atheist, has a bit of in ha but a most excellent sign, my friend, even the most trustworthy, because our Russian atheist, if only he's a true atheist and has a bit of intelligence, is the best man in the whole world and has and always inclined to treat God nicely, because he's unfailingly kind, and he's kind because he's immeasurably pleased that he's an atheist. Our atheists are respectable people and trustworthy in the highest degree. The support, so to speak, of the fatherland. <sighs> yeah, so I, 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 I really highly suggest people who are socialist, atheist, anarchist, any sort of uh, incredibly critical people to read Dostoevsky's because I think he really trains uh, hubris into somebody because he provides really well represented arguments and I think he sort of shows you the flaws of yourself in a way. He holds a mirror to the thinker. I think that's a very important lesson to go through. Um, to love people as they are is impossible, and yet one must. And therefore do good to them, clenching your feeling, holding your nose, and shutting your eyes. This last is necessary. Endure evil from them, not getting angry with them if possible, remembering that you too are a human being. Naturally, you're in a position to be severe with them, if it's been granted you to be a little bit smarter than average. People are mean by nature and love to love out of fear. Don't give in to such love and don't cease to despise it. Somewhere in the Quran, Allah bids the Prophet to look upon the re recalcitrant as mice, to do good as them and pass them by. Somewhat arrogant, but right. So, uh, again on the atheist question, I think that uh, what Dostoevsky brings, which is a relevant thing to the conversation, which is cute, it's flattering, is that the atheists are the goodest of all because there's no reason to be good and they simply do it. So an atheist with a pure heart is somebody who essentially lives a thankless existence uh, representing morality in a system that does not necessarily value that. Um, so know how to despise them, even when they're good. For most often it's just here when they're nasty. Oh my dear, I'm judging myself. I'm judging by myself and saying that. He who is only a little bit better than stupid cannot live and not despise himself. Whether he's honest or honest, dishonest makes no difference. To love one's neighbor and not despise him is impossible. In my opinion, man is created with a physical inability to love his neighbor. There's some mistake in words here from the beginning. And love for man's kind should be understood as just for that mankind which you yourself have created in your soul. In other words, you've created your, your own self and the love for yourself in which, therefore, will never exist in reality. Um, so, since I wasn't consulted at the time of the creation of the world, I reserve for myself the right to have my own opinion about it. So, uh, I think that that passage is very interesting. I don't bring it up as, like, this is the be-all, end-all philosophy, but what I think are... These are immortal conversations. That's what Chekhov described them as. And I think that it's like, these are still conversations, like, even like the, the quick bit about specializing quickly is like, it's like, is that not the current paradigm? Where it's like, get the fuck out of school and get, go into the trades. That's what Dostoevsky was talking about. Because like, that was the industrial revolution, is that people kept doing all this useless shit and uh, getting away from traditional human life, which was typically tied to productivity. Um... And then, like, this spontaneous power of just getting along with ideas where it's, like, nothing is truly concrete or moral or in existence, you know? And also just the loving people as they are and, like, you know, it's essentially turning the other cheek. And, like, just the acceptance that, like, humans 
are awful. Life is awful. This is hell. We're going to go through mostly struggle, but you do your best. You try to be patient and you try to just think your way through to a healthy reaction to things. You know, it doesn't matter the epistemology. It doesn't matter the definition. It just matters that you tried your best. Um, and uh, I think that his, rep his conversations come across as incredibly modern. And uh, I didn't even tell you who was speaking because it doesn't, the context doesn't really matter as much as it's just like the existence of these conversations. Being trained in 1800s lit, you see that people used to talk in much different ways. People used to be much more direct and also just have a cursory knowledge of information. And the art of conversation has gone downhill. Uh, people mostly just kind of repeat things. Uh, it's, it's weird. It's weird. It kind of looks like a seizure, honestly. But, um, you know, so I think that also the adolescent, I think, if you're a young person, definitely start here. Definitely start with this one. Uh, if you're in your 30s, start with the idiot. Um, but that's also the thing is that the idiot, I think, is a brilliant image of an ineffectual man because essentially it's the Russian Christ where this person is so pure they cannot implement their will or their view. Because it's like, yeah, who gives a fuck if you know that what's happening shouldn't happen? Who gives a fuck if you know that it's wrong? Can you stop it? Will you do anything? Will you stand up for people? No? Then you're useless. You might be beautiful. You might have a pure heart. You might resemble a child or a lamb, but like that's not what's needed. What's needed in a place like uh, Russia or a place like the world is ultimately somebody with uh, a lot of fucking violence. Like You need somebody who will protect things. You need somebody who's willing and capable of preserving society in the state that it is. So that comes with a lot of responsibility where it's like you're going to have to do things that aren't so pure, that don't line up with your morality perfectly, and that's just a real facet of life, and that sort of removes the possibility of being purely good, because even being purely good wouldn't be good because the good wouldn't be able to be implemented. You have to be a little bit mixed. You have to accept that you are both good and bad, and that every human is good and bad, and that the worst human being can do good things, and that the best human being can do bad things. You just have to make your peace with these truths to become a full moral person, in my perspective. And we're ending it off with, uh, let's see, can I find my bookmark? Yep. I think that when a person laughs, in the majority of cases, it becomes repulsive to look at. Uh, most often, something banal is revealed in, per in a person's laughter, in people's laughter. Something as if humiliating for the laugher. Though the laughing one always knows nothing of the impression he makes, just as he doesn't know as gen nobody generally knows what kind of face he has when he's asleep. Some sleepers have intelligent faces even in sleep, while other faces, even intelligent ones, become very stupid in sleep and therefore ridiculous. I don't know what makes this happen. I only want to say that a laughing man like a sleeping one most often knows nothing about his face. A great many people don't know how to laugh at all. However, there's nothing to know here. It's a gift. It can't be fabricated. It can only be fabricated by re-educating oneself, developing oneself for the better, and overcoming the bad instincts of one character. Then the laughter of such a person might quite possibly change for the better. Laughter calls, first of all, for sincerity. But where is there any sincerity in people? Laughter calls for your lack of spite. People most often laugh spitefully. Sincere and unspiteful laughter is mirth. But where is there any mirth in our time, and do people know how to be mirthful? People will suck the dick of David Foster Wallace all fucking day because of new sincerity, new authenticity. But what about fucking mirth, bro? What about, like, it's like, I understand, it's just, I get fucking annoyed when people don't just care about the history of ideas because, like, modernity hit. It hit. It changed the world. And the idea of, like, you know, sincerity changing because you're no longer just a simple human. You now exist in the societal complex context. Like, you know, it's like back in, like, the 1900s, a world-class city was a million people. Now we've got cities with, like, what? Like, up upwards of, like, what? 20 million fucking people? That's, that's a lot. That's a fucking lot. So when you're dealing... Like, it's, just, it's annoying to me that everybody thinks these issues are new. When it's like, we've been talking about this at least for 200 years. This has been a cycle of recreation for at least 200 years. Um, so only a man of the loftiest and happiest development knows how to be mirthful infectiously. That is, irresistibly and good-heartedly. I'm not speaking of his mental development, but of his character, of the whole man. So, mirth 
I would say is related to surrender. It requires you to give up some sort of anchoring of yourself to fully give yourself to the moment and the people around you. And I think that that is not possible today because people simply don't have the investment. Uh, if a man has a good laugh, it means he's a good man. The moment you notice the slightest trace of stupidity in someone's laughter, it undoubtedly means the man is of limited intelligence, though he may do nothing but pour out ideas. Which So I'm just going to... So, unconsciously borrowed. And later on, the man is certain to change for the worse and to take up what's useful and throw away his noble ideas without regret as the errors and infatuation of youth. So, he considers this the most serious conclusion of his life. But I understand that laughter is the surest test of a soul. Look at a child only. A child knows how to laugh perfectly. So, an old man looks towards the grave, but a young man must live. Not much for the soul to hang on to, as it seems, but it holds on still, and still it's glad of the world. An old man, art, <laughs> an old man ought to depart in a handsome way. Again, if you meet death with murmuring or displeasure, it's a great sin. There we go. So, the laughter and the things. I think that Dostoevsky really is a modern update and like perhaps the best at uh the best at making modern the animal versus man debate and distinction in classical philosophy because there is simply the reality of living and then there are the moral and spiritual beings and you have to come to terms with being both you got to get drunk you got to piss you got to fight you got to kill you got to serve in the military you got to fuck all these things are part of life but you also have the moral sentiment and the understanding of a developed and complex being. And the war between these two things is incredibly difficult to go through. And I think that we sort of just ignore it, where we have, like, you know, the evangelicals, where it's like, the world is only spiritual. And then you have the hedonists, where it's like, the world's only material. But it's like, no, there's this sort of spiritual materialism. And that's where it's like, I don't care if somebody believes in God. I don't care about epistemology. I care about what you do. I think that your actions reveal your faith. If you take care of people and you do your best to make the world a better place, I think that you are somebody who is invested in God, essentially. Uh, use whatever word you want. Um, just benefit good. I use the word good. Just add another fucking O. Uh, you're invested in good, and therefore I think that you are within meaning. But all of this, like all these Russians, are struggling with a lack of meaning. Like that's like where it swells and it swells and it's and these people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. They don't have really implementable in, implementable ideals or uh, policy. You know, so you're dealing with these people who are ultimately immature. Uh, they're not good politicians. They're not good. Uh, they they are not talented statecraft. So what we want, what we you need in life, what I'd say is what's the most important lesson for you as a viewer. And like what would fix the world is pragmatism. Pragmatism. You have to, you can't have ideas. You can't have feelings. You can't think something is kind of dope. You can't feel something's kind of dope. You got to look at the implementation of everything that you think and see what you can do incrementally, step by step. Could you improve a bus stop in your neighborhood? Could you vote to have a rail, uh, a railway uh, expanded? Could you vote to have more local businesses have more benefits over corporate uh, encroachment in your neighborhoods could you volunteer to help build shelter could you do any of these things because not to talk shit on mission trips but it's like dude there's so much in your city and so much in your country that needs help there are children who do not have a good relationship with their parents that need skills and need socialization and you can do that if you're good at excel dude you know how much fucking money a kid can make from excel if you were good at excel at 14 you could get an internship fucking quick so exactly my point is that just like, you know, invest in your community, invest in the real world, invest in the thing that fucking made you, dude, just take care of what's around us. Um, cause otherwise it's like, well, what about all these grand debates? What about the theory of capital? What about all these things? It's like, dude, like, do you really think that how much influence do you think you fucking have over these things? Do you really think that it's the individual people who've decided history? Sorry, not to get into conspiratorial things, but it's like. You just see these cycles. You just, you just see these cycles where it's like, uh, so again, like, yeah, with my family, it's like they're obese people who are mostly alcoholics who are on pharmacological substances. Several of the, uh, of the pharmacological substances are known to have side effects that increase weight. 
Uh, they live very sedentary lifestyles and they don't eat healthy. You know, it's like all of those things are beneficial towards the status quo because you have a car dependent suburb where they don't have the ability to walk around. So them not walking actually allows them to buy into the car dependent suburb. You have fast food, which is a cycle of addiction because everything in McDonald's or the majority of things in McDonald's, except for the chicken have added sugar and sugar is more addictive than cocaine. We'll bring a fucking study up that on Monday. Um, and they're drinking alcohol, which is uh, basically the sugar water, which is going to repeat into the cycle of obesity, and also they're diabetic. So this is going to further deteriorate the body, lead to high blood sugar problems, and lead to insulin issues. Um, and then, you know, it's like, so you have all these things which are profitable because the fast food is making money, is making money hand over fist, alcohol hand over fist, uh, pharmaceuticals hand over fist. And they're making them fatter, they're making them less healthy, they're making them more sedentary, and all this is profitable. And it's simply because it just, you know, it's advertised to them. It's like, what, it's the path they went down, and now it's just kind of like too late to buck the system and just like, you know, flip around from it. And that's where, you know, like that's... That's where you gotta stand for something, you know? I don't need you to agree with me on my epistemology. I'm not a warrior for a certain level of belief, but I am a warrior for self-care and like self-love and healthiness and like taking care and making safe environments and things like that. So um, that's, I feel like that's like kind of a heavy point, but at the same time, I think that makes sense where it's just like, you know, it's like just find your symbols. Find your symbols. We were talking about man and his symbols. Uh, everything is unique. Everything is individually processed by you. You are your own language. So find the things that matter to you and fill your life with them and dedicate your life to them. It will become more meaningful. Uh, I suggest living love. That's just me. I'm a fucking hippie. Um, bands. Bands, bands, bands. Michigan bands. Fuck yeah. So we're going to start with the, the softest shit. Charmer. Pretty band. Pretty band. They got like a really uh, welcoming sound, very very easy aesthetic to get into. Uh, Bummer Summer. It's a lot of fun. It's got a reference to Adderall in it that's going to sure to hit with the kids. Um, this is from 2018. I'm pretty sure this band was active for six years, so this is like, uh, you know, they're getting, they're, they're almost veterans. Maybe they are veterans. Uh, coming up next, a little bit, little bit more plugged in, a little bit more pop punky, uh, Brave Bird. Uh, it's like pop punk without the fucking marketability or the like severe songwriting. It's not very consistent. It's like very open, airy, indie rock, sad theme, very whiny vocals. Fucking awesome. Love them. Uh, they got a seven, seven track thing here and they got a 10 track thing here. I'd probably suggest this one over that one. And they got some, I'm pretty sure both of those are smaller. Uh, 2011, 2014. That's my fucking era of music. Love the emo coming out that time, spe specifically Michigan emo coming out that time. Love the hip hop. It was a great fucking time. Uh, I'm pretty. I, I wonder when Attack by Danny Brown was because that song is a fucking banger. Um, but then, so next we got coming out of Detroit. So you know, um, Dogleg, uh, really approachable, fun fucking band. Uh, if you like pretty guitar, if you like just rock music, and you're into like the scene, if you're like, uh, you like anything that's like just you know a little bit powery, a little bit screamy. A little bit just, you know, intense. Also just like, you know, really riffy. Take them a sh give them a shot. Uh, local boys, punch, dance punch dancing out the rage. You know, represent, guys. Fucking good job. Uh, then we got Flight Patterns. My boys out of AA. Um, fucking all over the place. They have some of the prettiest guitar. They've got like, like Crab with Knife is a literal hardcore track. Uh, they got scream vocals. They got, it's just... It's a whole experience, but they are, you can tell that they're Midwest emo because they have a Meyer bag on single art. So that is just vetted. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm just a big fan of these guys. Uh, been really digging their sound, really excited to see where they go with it. This is from 2017. No big albums yet, so I just really want to see what they can do with it. I really, I think they can do something fun. I think that they are definitely people to watch out for. And then the people to return to, the people that we all fucking have probably heard about before, La Dispute, out of Grand Rapids. My brother used to work at a pizza place with Jordan's girlfriend. Isn't that funny? Um, but, ah, uh, that early discography, 
literally, I remember this was high school as well. This was definitely like, you know, this was the emo core back when Lyle was a baby. It was fucking sick, dude. Uh, the Touche split, uh, Searching for a Pulse, also highly recommended. Love that shit. Uh, yeah. Rooms of the House. If you're looking for a soft Law Dispute song, this is the hardest band out of all of these. Uh, I would say Woman Reading. Uh, this is where I'd recommend to start if you're into the, like, you know, more soft, bedroomy vibe. Um, anyways, what are we doing for time? We're at 54 minutes. So, that was the first week. We put out three hours of content. 20, 20, 20, 20, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of the deal with this. Uh, today, I just really wanted to hammer home a lot of Michigan, a lot of Michigan bands, a lot of Michigan boys, because, uh, you know, represent, uh, super happy, super happy with the genre, happy that Michigan's sound is just that it's like, oh man, I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the sun in like three months. You want to hear about my, uh, breakup from 2017? I'm on a robot tussing. I'm trying to like, you know, I've been living with my parents for a while, but I was like, I don't know. I'm thinking about doing landscaping or something. Like, it's just like that. <laughs> like, it's just that vibe and a fucking album. If you're depressed, it'll, it'll, it is a, it's a tribe. Uh, it's funny because it does sound so melodramatic, but then you just fucking live here, dude. And you're just like, oh shit, people live this way. It's funny. Uh, I'd say it's like definitely it's that folk music vibe there's also a couple different eras um count your lucky stars as a label fucking amazing also so shouts out to non-michigan bands thank you i'm sorry breakfast in silence hospital bracelet uh sleepy dog uh That's all i want to do right now but i i'm i'm looking at covering them because uh they're some of them are are count your lucky stars uh, associate associated but uh fucking awesome sound just like really big fan of uh, a lot of those bands and like i think they're under under undervalued undervalued because i think they only like they just don't let me let me pull up that spotify uh so let's see thank you thank you i'm sorry this is a count your lucky stars band but so if we're going to the da, 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 so on Spotify, they have 160,000 on their most popular track, and they have 9,000 monthly listeners. Really underrated, in my opinion. Really underrated. Uh, smooth, easy listening band, no scream. I think that they're definitely going to pick up. But that's just me, that's just me talking shit. Uh, thanks for tuning in. It is so fucking hot. Uh... We'll be back next week, hopefully with more links. All the links from this episode will be in the description. Review everything on your own leisure. This is a comedy show. This is an entertainment show. None of this is serious. None of this is advice. Do not base any life decisions off this show. Do that off your own research. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, anyways. So, we're wrapped up here. Um, be back Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Check me out. I mean, I guess use the KFC kfc uh so kf cannabis at twitter that's uh probably the the thing i'm going to use uh submit anything you want to highlight podcast at gmail.com and uh just enjoy your weekend enjoy your weekend thanks for tuning in really appreciate it uh see you tuesday